Howdy ho, sports fans. Today, we're going to cover ANOVA with SAS. We'll review a little bit, and then we'll dive into a couple of examples. We're just going to do PROC GLM today, and tomorrow we'll do PROC Mixed. So let's look at statistical procedures with SAS in general. You have PROC, the procedure name, data equals, the data set name, and then you have some statement, required parameters, and a slash, and some options. Now, analysis of variance in general using GLM, PROC GLM uses the general linear procedure. Class identifies the categorical variables to be used as independent variables in ANOVA. Model, the dependent equals the independence, specifies the mean model to be tested with possibly some options in it, and means the independent variable slash some options request information on the means. So that's the general format. SAS also offers a lot of post hoc options. The most commonly used ones are the Tukey and Shafay, and all of those will give you the same difference between means, because the difference between means is always the same, but the critical values and the confidence intervals may be different. So if you want to impress your friends, you could know that the Tukey assumes equal ends for each group, but there is a Tukey Kramer test that's used when the ends are different. And if your ends are different, SAS automatically does the Tukey Kramer, which means that it automatically does the appropriate test. So that's kind of cool, and probably one of the reasons that the Tukey is such a popular post hoc test. So here's how you would do an analysis of variance. Lib name, some libref like n, the directory where your data are kept, proc glm, data equals, the data set name, class, here's your condition, your independent variable, model, your dependent equals your independent, means type slash tukey, so there you go. A two-way analysis variance looks very much the same, except you'll have two variables in your class statement. And then in your model statement, you would have the two independent variables. And then this means the interaction of the two. And if you have a mean statement, you can get the means for the each of the independent variables. You can get the means for the combination of them. The Tukey is going to do the Tukey pairwise comparison comparison, and it's going to, right here, give you means by a child IEP, which is whether or not their child had an IEP, type, which would be, I think in this case, the type of training they got, and child IEP times type of training. It will also compute pairwise comparisons. If you have three or more means, the difference between pairs and confidence intervals is shown. If you only have two means, the means are shown with the letter and the means with the same letter are not significantly different. If you leave off the two key or other post hoc test on the mean statement, you get the means and standard deviations for each group. If you want both the means and standard deviation as well as the two key post hoc test, you can use two mean statements. So just a reminder that there are four types of sums of squares and the type one sum of squares is a default on the ANOVA output, and it's also called the sequential sum of squares. So the type one sum of squares compares the means of each group on the first independent variable with the means of each group, on, of, of each other group, unadjusted for the values of the second independent variable. So it doesn't take into account the other variables in the model for the first independent variable. The type three sum of squares is also by default, so you get both types by default if you don't do anything. And the type three sum of squares compares the means of each group on the first variable controlling for the second variable in the model. So the type three sum of squares produces analysis of covariance results. How about that? Now we're on to repeated measures in OVA. So you have two groups, probably experimental control. You tested them, you did something, you test them again, and you want to know, is there a significant difference between the two groups? But particularly, you want to know, is there a significant difference between the two groups and how much they improve? So here's a repeated measures ANOVA. You do PROC GLM, same as always, class, 
model dependent one, dependent two, and you can have as many as you want. So if you tested them four times, you would list four equals the independent. And note here, the repeated measures are listed as the dependent variables. And then you have the repeated statement, name to call the repeated effect, and the number of times that it happened. So this I always found confusing. I still find it confusing, even though I know it. <laughs> and that is that the name in the repeated statement is not the name of any variable in your data set. And it's followed by the number of times the measure was repeated. So here's one example. Again, we did a study of the impact of people's knowledge on special education law and rights and so forth. So we had two types of people, I think. In, and so we had a pre-test and a post-test. And we wanted to know if the improvement from pre-test to post-test differed by type. And we have our repeated year test, and it was repeated twice. So let's, having looked at this in general, let's look at some specific examples now. So here we have some data from an actual study where students were exposed to one of two conditions. There was an intervention program in their school that was designed to improve math and science and attitudes there too. And the question was, was there a greater improvement from pre to post test for students who were in the condition? So condition is our independent variable here and in our class statement, than for the students who were not. Now, ignore all this stuff up here, that man behind the curtain, that was just to get these data into shape for a PROC GLM. Later on in the class, not today, we will use these same data to do a PROC mix that you'll learn about later. But for now, we've got PROC GLM, data equals our data set name, class our independent, which is the condition, and model here are our repeated measures, pretest and post-test equals condition, slash no uni. If you forget this, it doesn't hurt your analysis. It just gives you a bunch of univariate statistics you don't need. Repeated test score. I just made up a word, test score. Two, it was repeated twice. There were two levels, one and two. And then I also want the means of condition. So I'm going to click my little running guy here. Run. And so first I see that I have two levels of condition, which I expected. You either win the treatment or you weren't. 386 variables, 342 of them used. The dependent variable was test score. It had two levels, one and two, which I expected. My first test is for the hypothesis of no test score effect. And it gives me a Wilkes lambda of about 0.98. A probability is less than 0.05, though not a whole lot less. It's got a fairly small f value. A plays trace. So it says it's explained about 1.4% of the variance, which is not a whole lot. It, if you think about it, it's kind of equivalent to a correlation of like 0.12. So not zero, but not super impressive. Then down here, what I'm really interested in is the test score by condition effect. Did that the students who participated in this experimental program, did their test scores go up more than those who didn't? And here, sadly for the client, there was no significant effect. The F value was 2.67, and you could see that less than 1% of the variance was explained by condition. But I got paid anyway, because like Evil Knievel, I get paid for the attempt. And so I analyzed their data, and sadly for them, there was no impact of their study. Over here, hypothesis, um, repeated measures between subjects effects. That's not what we're really interested in. What we're really interested in, as I said, was the uh, condition, was the by test score interaction. Did the students improve more who were in the condition? And we see that this was not significant. Now, we'll look at our... Uh, I look at our means here, and you can see that the means are fairly close, it's slightly under 700 here, right about 700 there. This is on our pretest. On our post test, slightly under 700 still, right above 700. Now let's take a look at the means. So the actual value of the means, 683 on the pretest for the no intervention. 
and about 685 on the post-test. For those who got the intervention, so they were at 696, so they were already quite a bit above, and at 705 for the post-test. Here's something to keep in mind, though, and that is that for reasons unbeknownst to me, they multiplied the scores by 10. So these are actually percentages. So really, it improved from 68 per, basically 68% to 68.5% here. And over here, from 70% to 70.5%, more or less. So... It looks like it's a 10 point, almost a 10 point jump, but really it wasn't. I don't know why they multiply that. In terms of standard deviation units, it was, you, you average these out approximately. Say we have a standard deviation of a little over 40. And so that 10 point is somewhere around a fourth of a standard deviation improvement for the group that got the intervention. And quite a bit less. But again, if, if you talk about in absolute terms, moving from a seven, qu not quite 70% to not quite 71% is, is not a major improvement. So in substantive terms, there was not a big shift. And in terms of statistical significance, there was not any improve, greater improvement of the intervention group. So... So these people were sad that their intervention did not work, and I was sad for them because they paid me and they were nice. So let's take a look at another study. This is actually from the games that my company develops. So we've got ProcGLM, data equals games, class, school. I had to do some other analysis before this because this is actual data and I couldn't show you the names of the schools since it's confidential. So I recoded them to control and experimental. So independent variable of school model has two tests, pre and post test equals school slash no uni. Repeated test score, not very creative, so I use the test score again. Test score was repeated two times. The levels are one and two. And I have three mean two mean statements here and LS mean statements just for uh, educational purposes, just to show you what they do. So mean school slash two key, mean school, and LS mean school. So let's run this and see what we get. So here are our results. We had two schools, control experimental, 83 observations. We had... Um, two levels of the dependent variable, test score one and two, the pre and post test. And even though I always run through this and you maybe think it's a little bit boring, these kind of boring little things are crucial because if you have more levels than you thought, it's really going to throw your results off and it's probably because you had some data entry errors. So I find the hypothesis of no test score effect is rejected, so that's good. Um, about 6% of the variance is explained from pre to post test, so that's good. But sadly, over here, I find that somewhere about a little over 1% of the variance is explained by the interaction between test score and school. So I am a little sad there. So we found that there is an improvement from pre to post test, but it doesn't seem to be significantly higher for the students who were who played the games versus not. Now, keep in mind something here, though. Let's see if you can, as we scroll down, this is why I did the mean statement. This will tell you that in our experimental school, we had 71 students that play the game, and in our control group school, we had 12. Now, this is a very unbalanced design, obviously, which is one of the reasons we used ProcGLM. But also, this is one of the things that happens when you use real data. We're funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and we work in a lot of very small schools. So those 12 kids were all of the kids in fourth and fifth grade at that school. And similarly, the 71 were all of the kids in fourth and fifth grade at the other school. So even though, as you will see, if you scroll back up here, 
he, this, the t schools were already somewhat apart. It's kind of hard to tell from the graphs, which is why I wanted to do the mean statement. There's the 38 per, so about 38%, correct, was the pretest score for the control group and about 48% for the experimental group. We look at the post-test, and when we look at, they were not significantly different at the beginning, right? When we look at the post-test, we see that they went from being 10 points apart to over 15 points apart. So that both the control group and the experimental group went up in test scores, which you would expect because we tested them, you know, after one quarter of school. So you'd hope that their test scores went up. But the students who were in the experimental group went up substantially more, more than twice what the students in the control group did. And they went, you know, from being 10 points higher to more than 15 points higher as far as percentage. So it's a subdistinctive difference in both absolute and relative terms, but it's not statistically significant. Why? Because we had a small sample size. So one of the reasons I kind of harp on this a lot is people start out thinking that significance is all there is. And when we get results like these, we've done this study many times and replicated many times over and have always found the same results, that the experimental group comes out substantially higher. And so if we can find that, even if it's non-significant, and of course sometimes it is significant with larger sample sizes, but we find that same result over and over, that as well as the size of the difference, as well as... Um, significance are all things that you should consider and not just say, oh, I've got 0.05, let me run out. Or it's 0.32, this didn't work. The mean statement, my second mean statement here, gave me the mean standard deviation for each group. So pretest, as you can see, the control group had a standard deviation of about 11, a mean of about 38, experimental group had a standard deviation of about 18, mean of 48, and the standard deviations in both groups went up a little bit, and the mean of the control group went up a little bit, and of the experimental group quite a bit. LS means is simply the means adjusted for the other terms in the model. I just put that in here to show you what it does. Now, in this case, it doesn't really do anything because there are no other terms in the model, right? There's just uh, which school they're in. But if there had been other terms, these might have been different from what you saw before. So that is a couple of examples. And I really wanted to show these non-significant ones. I do have significant results for our games, I really do. But I wanted to show them because sometimes when you get simulated data, like in the textbook, it, everything always comes out significant. And I find that a little disturbing because then I will have students come to me, say, who are working on their dissertation, and they'll be really perturbed that they only explained 30% of the variance in something, which would be amazing. Or they'll be really perturbed that they didn't find statistical significance and think, well, what did I do wrong? And you could say what we did wrong here was we didn't have a larger sample size, but in fact, we had all the students at both schools. So. That's my point, is you can do all of your statistical analyses correctly and still not find statistical significance, even if the difference between groups is fairly substantial. So there you go, philosophical lesson of today. <laughs>